What I really want to harp here is IPL, Integrated Pest Management. That's probably the biggest key that we in the ag community can use and growers can use. You know, rotate your crops, use your cultural practices, use chemicals when necessary, but change those tools up. Welcome to Around the Farm, the podcast about all things ag. We're your hosts, Tom Versman. And Julie Vaughn. And today we're going to talk about pests. And we got a lot of cool things happening right now. And maybe not cool, maybe cool is not the right term for everybody. But, you know, the cicadas, mm -hmm. pest preventatives, how we can maybe even use field view in some of this. Julie, what, what have you dug into so far? And what, what are we going to chat about? You hit the nail on the head there, right? Some people think that bugs are just so interesting and others think that they're a little creepy. But we're going to talk today about how to deal with pests on your farm and then also recognizing the allies and the beneficials that are point. out there and then talking about the neutrals, the cicadas as well. The allies and the neutrals. I don't, I don't think I've ever felt or thought that way about pests, but hey, let's let's get into it. Yeah, I mean, when we talk about the allies, they really are on your team, right? Okay. And they're out there eating the pests, right? Perhaps keeping it down to a level where you could do some kind of chemical intervention, but if you could work with these bugs instead, you save money, you save crops, everybody benefits. Okay, what about the neutrals? Yeah, the neutral bugs, that's gonna be something more like our cicadas. Okay. And as those in the southeast United States, central and southeast, know, there are going to be two emerging broods. Okay. Perhaps you, kind listener, are already in the presence of the emergence of these two broods and listening to our voices competing in the decibel marketplace. I think we're pretty close. Uh, ground temperatures are warming up, um, at least here in Missouri. Uh, I know I was up in northern Illinois over the weekend, and it looked like some guys and gals were out there planting, but maybe still getting started. It was a little chillier up there, but hey, we're, we're probably getting close to these cic the cicadas coming out of the ground or however it works. Maybe you could shed a little light there, or maybe we're going to get into that with our interview. Let's go ahead and introduce our guest. So we spoke with Dr. Eric Blinka. He works here at Bear, and he's an entomologist. PhD in entomology. Absolutely, yes. Here's a little bit of his background. I grew up uh, in what we call Central Texas. If you know where Waco is, Austin is, and Bryan College Station, it makes a little triangle. I grew right up in the middle of that. As a kid, I, I kind of missed out on the farming. My grandparents sold their farm before they were uh, able to get me involved. So through high school, what I found was one of the best paying jobs was a cotton scout. And that's really what got me interested in insects. I was out there every summer scouting cotton, looking for insects, reporting to growers, helping them decide what they needed to do. And that really triggered my love for entomology. I had an opportunity to come up to where I slid into the TDR role, which is the technology development role here in North Carolina, and have been here now for, I think, going on eight years back in North Carolina. And uh, getting to do what I've always dreamed of doing, being in the field, uh, working with insects, working with crops, working with growers, doing testing, working with academics. Uh, this, is, this has always been my highlight of uh, of where I wanted to be for, for my career. And fortunately enough, being with Bear now, I've had the opportunity to stay here and continue to do what I love. So Julie, my wife, Valerie, has really been following the cicadas. And, and it's, you know, I don't know if being excited is the right terminology, but she is excited. She keeps telling me how this is this once in 200 years or once in 100 years, whatever the number is. Um, but maybe you could shed a little more light on what's happening with the cicadas, how it's going to impact potentially crops. And hey, maybe we got a question that we can ask the viewers to leave a comment on too, so we can dive into that. But go ahead and maybe tee it up a bit and give us some details before we turn it over to Eric. Yeah, so right now across the central to southeastern United States, there are two cicada broods emerging, and they both have a, a over a decade-long cycle where how it works is the cicadas emerge from the ground as adults. They shred their exoskeleton, and then they okay. kind of have like a bender for four weeks where they just go wild, they party, they mate, and then they lay their larvae on trees, and those larvae, they uh, emerge from their eggs, and they go down the trees into the ground, and they hang out in the roots of a tree for like 13 to 14 years. four-week bender. I'm still on that yeah, one. Yeah, they <laughs> just, good. they go wild. They really have a great time. You could hear them singing. Th those are the okay. boy cicadas. 
uh, they form what's known as choruses, actually. So the sounds are the male cicadas singing. Enticing the females. Okay. <laughs> yes. And it's a beautiful sound, many decibels loud. Um, but yeah, what you'll see is uh, the cicadas, when they emerge, they like to crawl upwards. You know, if they land on you, you might notice that they'll start just like Working trying. their way up. Yeah, they, they love to climb. They're little climbers. That's what they're about. When I spoke with Dr. Eric Blinka, my main concern was what kind of impact does this have on crops, right? That's the emergence question. of these cicadas. And this is what he had to say that the impact was from cicadas. So right now we're in a very amazing time. We have a kind of an annual cicada. It's called the dog day cicada that we'll find every year. It's a little bit larger. You know, it's kind of scattered throughout the, the U.S. But what's happening right now is there are these different species of cicadas that come out based on their life cycles. And we have two major groups. One group comes out every 17 years. Another group comes out every 13 years. And within those groups, you have what they call broods. And we just so happen to be where we have two broods coming out at the same time, one from the 17-year life cycle and one from the 13-year life cycle. And these are some of the biggest broods. So it's covering a really big geography. And as these things come out, it's really a spectacle to see and hear. Most of the damage that comes is from when they lay their eggs. They don't really cause damage to our agricultural crops per se, our row crops. Now, if you want to get technical, what they do do to ag some ag uh, crops would be our trees. When these females get ready to lay their eggs, what they do is they go and lay their eggs in the small young branches of trees. Those eggs start to develop in those branches and as they hatch and develop, the larvae drop down out of those branches to the soil. They'll dig down to the soil. And that's where they stay for about 17 years or 13 years based on their life cycle and feed on the roots of trees. One thing I'll say, too, is, you know, don't fear them. You know, a lot of people talk about plagues of locusts. These are not the same type of locust or cicada. Locusts are completely different. They're a type of grasshopper. These cicadas are not at all like you hear of the plagues. So nothing to fear from them there. Well, thanks, Eric, for that great overview. And, and Julie, I did say I wanted to ask our viewers a question just to get their thoughts because I know kind of mentally how I think about it. You know, every cicada's coming out of the ground. So to our viewers, do you think that the cicadas actually aerate your lawn for you? I would have to say that the cicadas, they're not necessarily emerging from disparate places across a lawn, right? Yeah, that's right. We can know where they're going to emerge from. It's going to be in tree roots primarily. So perhaps they're aerating tree roots, if that's even a thing. If that's a thing. One thing I can say to viewers, though, is if you have any immature trees in your yard, right? Like I'm talking about adolescent trees, probably three years or younger, and you want to protect those trees, uh, their lower branches are at risk of being split by the female cicadas when they lay their eggs. What they'll probably want to do is go get some like mosquito netting or mesh okay. from Home Depot and just uh, secure those branches just to keep the cicadas off. Because you know, a young tree, that's a pretty vulnerable plant for this type of situation. That's right. That's yeah, right. They can get messed up by the cicadas. But most mature trees will be absolutely fine. They, they'll probably enjoy the experience. If you have thoughts on that one, leave your comments down below and let us know what you're thinking. So moving on from cicadas to some of our more common pests and beneficials on the farm, yep. do you think you could name three insects that a farmer may be familiar with? Mm, three insects? Mm -hmm. Pests, beneficials, neutrals. I'm not, I'm not really a, a bug guy, yeah. Julie. Um, maybe like aphids? Mm. Aphids be one? Oh, that's a good one. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, what about a bull weevil? <laughs> don't know what a bull weevil is, it's I'll be a, honest with you. A bull weevil named after a cotton bull, okay. actually. So in my conversation with Dr. Eric Blinka, he mentioned one of what he considers to be the most successful interventions by scientists on behalf of United States agriculture okay. would be the intervention to reduce cotton bull weevils in the southeast and south of the United States. And here's what he had to say about that. That insect in itself had the biggest impact on any crop and on this country in the South as any other insect ever has. To this day, we are very lucky and very fortunate that a lot of these extension folks came up with the idea of helping to develop a eradication program for boll weevil. Understanding the cycle of these insect pests and seeing where we can break those cycles 
Bolville was a, was a perfect example of that. They were able to go in and see that it was a lone single host, which is cotton, and break that cycle of that insect and push it back down into southern Texas and into Mexico and keep most of our cotton growing region free of boll weevil. And uh, a lot of guys, it's been long enough, especially like over in our part of the world on the East Coast, have completely forgotten about boll weevil. But they still have to help with the eradication program. We are what we call in maintenance stage right now. So these guys still pay an assessment fee to help monitor. And if any boll weevils pop up and an immediate spray goes out to help eradicate these pests and keep them out of these growing regions. And so a lot of guys forget and don't quite understand why we did it or what it means to them. But if they go back and look in history and see how devastating boll weevil was, they'll understand that they're spending their money in a good way. Because that is one pest we do not want back in here, especially with the limited number of tools we have to, to help control bull weevil. That pest in itself, just the history of it and everything it's done, that's probably one of my biggest uh, insects that just I like talking and learning and understanding the history of. Less exotic than the cotton bull weevil. Julie, what, what other pests are out there that you think we'll be seeing during the next few months here or even, even as we get into later in the year? Yeah, so there's, I mean, the most omnipresent that we're going to see across all the cotton, corn, and soybeans would probably be the corny earworm. But I asked that same question uh, to Dr. Eric Blinka, and here is the list of pests that you can expect to see across those three crop types. Let's see it. Just starting out with some of the early season stuff, you know, a lot of them are in the ground. They're insects that are attacking our seed itself and attacking the seedling plants. We're talking about seed corn maggot, wire worms, bill bug comes out later, chinch bug, corn flea beetle, and then as we get a little bit farther along, cut worms, southern corn leaf beetle. Uh, occasional pests that we'll see are like slugs, white grubs, sod worms, stink bugs. And then as we move into the season later on, we'll hit up some corn leaf aphids, spider mites, stock borers. European corn borer has always been a traditional big pest of corn, followed up by fall army worm and corn ear worm. As we move into soybeans, you'll see that a lot of the characters are the same ones that you see in corn, especially that early on. Uh, you've got these insect pests that are in the ground, like the seed corn maggot, the white grumps, the cut worms that come along and cut down plants. Some that are more distinctive to soybeans are like lesser corn stalk borer, soybean aphid, bean leaf beetle, soybean gall midge, which is a newer one for uh, the Midwest. And then you'll get occasional pests like thrips. As we move into a little bit later season, you're still looking at bean leaf beetle that comes along. you got pod worms, stink bugs, soybean aphids, green, clo green clover worms, spider mites, soybean loopers, and occasionally grasshoppers. As we shift over to cotton, our early season pests in cotton typically are like thrips. Uh, once we get past the thrips window, we start to get a little bit farther along. We get into uh, tarnished plant bugs. And depending on where you are growing cotton, you can also get uh, cotton flea hoppers. Once we get past that, you'll jump into cotton bollworm, which is the same thing as soybean podworm, same thing as corn earworm. It just goes from one crop to another. So this is a very interesting pest. But what you can also get confused with is the tobacco budworm, which is a, a traditional pest of cotton. And then some occasional pests that we'll see are aphids and spider mites. So Julie, er Eric's done a really good job teeing this up and really walking through. And shoot, I've learned a lot here in the last little bit listening to him talk. As we think about tools to help with pests, I know with FieldView, um, you, you know, it's a great resource where you can go out, take pictures of damage, upload to a pin. You have kind of that record and you can follow back up. But what other tools? Because there's there's more tools out there as well to help and and basically walk you through this process through this time of year. So what, what do you got? What are you thinking about uh, on top of FieldView? Yeah, so Dr. Eric mentioned IPM, and that okay. includes, you know, rotating your crops, right? If if the pests have come accustomed to there being corn there every year, maybe it's a good time to mix something else into that field. Uh, different cultural practices around tilling or no tilling, Okay. Yep. right? The more you disturb the earth, the more then you're going to mess up those eggs and everything that's under the soil. That's so right. you want to, of course, balance that with the other practices on your farm. And then rotating the different tools available in different hybrids or different applications that may be pest resistant. And 
a little bit about those tools that Dr. Eric Blinko went into. Let's hear from him about those tools and what different extension agents may be able to provide for farmers. What I really want to harp here is IPL, Integrated Pest Management. That's probably the biggest key that we in the ag community can use and growers can use. You know, rotate your crops, use your cultural practices, use chemicals when necessary, but change those tools up. I know we're getting more and more limited on the tools we have in our toolbox, but the more we rotate those things around, the longer and longer we can keep resistance at bay. And that is our key is to keep these things susceptible to whatever tools we're using, because once we lose a tool, it's gone. It, we, it's hard to get anything back, uh, whether it's due to resistance or being pulled off the market. So I'd say those are probably the biggest keys that we can use going into the season. Having been a, a, a scout and a consultant myself, I'm going to say that's the number one place to start is have somebody scout in your fields. Even if it's you, if you're a grower, make sure you're scouting your fields. Know what's going on out there. Know what you're planting into. Nobody knows your fields better than you or your scout who's out there every week. And sometimes maybe they need to be out there more than every week, maybe a couple of times a week, depending on what the pest pressure looks like. So, Julie, besides field view, what other tools or actions can be taken on farm to help combat against pests? So, when we spoke to Dr. Eric Blinko, we brought that very question to him, right? Mm -hmm. And there's, of course, there's IPM, there's rotating your crops, yep. there's making decisions about tillage, if you're going to be tilling, how much you're going to be tilling, and then rotating the different tools at your disposal. So, that could be anything like choosing between different hybrids or choosing what kind of applications you're going to be using in order to combat those pests. Makes and sense. Yeah, there's also extension agent entomologists at different universities. Like one example that he brought up was a thrips protection tool that farmers can use. And here's what he had to say about that. Uh, one we have that NC State over here developed is a, a thrips predictor for our cotton growers. So cotton growers can go in and look based on the environmental conditions that they're having at the, in their geography. They can put all their information into this predictor. It'll tell them if the upcoming week is gonna be a good week to plant and can avoid some of those thrips or if it's gonna be into the heat of it. So there's tools that your extension entomologists do to, to help you growers out and it's the readily available. A lot of data goes into it. So I'd say that's a, a, a num another point to, to hit up is your extension entomologist your field agronomists from your different companies. They spend a lot of time out there with their products. They kind of see what's going on with their products and can help guide you on to the best use of their products. Whether it's this product is going to be for a hot spot, you know, this product has the best trait package and is what you need for an area that's going to be heavy infestation, or this might be the best chemistry. Another resource would, of course, be field agronomists, right? They're familiar with what kind of products are in the soil in your region, and they can provide you with a little bit more information about tailoring what you're using for the different pests that might be emerging in your area. That's right. That local level knowledge mm -hmm. is really valuable. Yeah. And what Dr. Blinka said was it's incredibly important to communicate within your neighbors to see what they're growing, right? Specialty crops might have different demands and then products products blowing off from one farm to another, from one field to another, they might have different impacts on different crops. So knowing what your neighbors are planting or what kind of applications they're using can be really helpful in understanding how that's going to impact your pest ecosystem. No, that's really good. And I, I think, you know, again, just just those relationships, right? Those are huge and being able to tell the story and, and even prepare for what could happen on farm. I think that's a really good call out. Yeah, and, and then another part of that will be how the different, possibly the chemicals that you're applying on your farm are gonna impact beneficials. So what are beneficials? Beneficials are those allies, those bugs that are working on your side against the pests. And we don't wanna harm our allies, right? And so there are different chemicals you can look into their prescription of how they should be applied where and how they're gonna impact different beneficials in different areas. So it's important to read those labels, to understand what's going into the ground and how it's going to infect those beneficials. Mm -hmm. And here's a list of those beneficials and how they work together. You got things like minute pirate bugs, damsel bugs, green lacewing, spine soldier bugs, brown lacewing, big-eyed bugs, assassin bugs, lady beetles. I mean, they're just all over the place. 
And most of these uh, beneficial insects, what they'll do is they'll feed on f- feed on some of the eggs of damaging pests, like bollworm eggs. They'll go and feed on them. Aphids they'll feed on. Some of the small nymph stage of our pest, these beneficials will feed on as well. So a lot of times if you have a, a population building up, and this is just an example of aphids, if you kind of give it a little time, um, you know, know what that e- economic threshold is that's set by the extension uh, agents. And if you can hang right around that economic threshold level and not so high that you need to take action, just hold on. And a lot of times these lace wings, these ladybugs, these different beneficials will come in. And I tell you, they'll start hammering on those uh, insect populations and they just love going to town feeding on those aphids and, and different insect pests. So be patient with them. Make sure if you do have to use a chemical application, think about what you're using. We have gotten very good at developing insecticides that are very target specific and are easier on some of these beneficials. So take a look at what you're putting out there. Use a chemistry that's as soft as you can on these beneficials, kind of work together. Because we have seen in the past, if guys go out with something very harsh, especially at the wrong time, you can take out both the insect pest, but the beneficials as well, and then get a resurgence of your insect pest. And that's not a good day. So really think about what you're using Uh, From a chemistry standpoint, allow it to be as soft as it can on the beneficials and let those little guys help you out as much as possible. Yeah, it's it's neat to hear Eric talk about the beneficials and, you know, bees for an example, right? That's one I think most people would would know about as, as a very beneficial bug in agriculture in general with pollination. But Julie, you know, what other bugs, pests maybe is the probably the proper term? What what else is out there? So yeah, the other pollinators, right, we've got bees. Uh, We we have other insects that specifically prey on what we think of as those common pests, right? So we've got like damselbugs or green lacewings, big-eyed bugs. Uh, And what they do is they actually feed on like the larva of, of those pests. And so when we're looking at like chemical applications, right, we wanna make sure that the application may not hinder the beneficials. Because if you wipe out the beneficials and the pests, well, there may be another emergence of those pests down the line. That's right. And then there's nothing to kind of combat them within the ecosystem, except for another application, right? And that's that's money out of your pocket. Makes sense. Now, before we head out here, I did want to mention just one tactic that Eric Blinka had brought up. And most folks are familiar with doing some sort of testing to see what kind of pests are on farms. Okay, yep. And so what we spoke a little bit was about before planting, doing a trap. A trap. Yeah, to catch bugs. And there are like quite a few different tactics to do that in our technological era, right? You could do photo sensors that just like count bugs as they walk over the sensor. But here's what Dr. Blinka said is a good tactic for counting and becoming aware of what bugs are in your field. But the biggest thing is for these things in the soil, they're hard to really scout for. What we can do is create a bait station uh, before you get ready to go plant a field, go out a week or two before, put you a little bit of corn into uh, a little hole, come back about a week later or a couple days later, see if any of these insects have come to that little pile of corn and see what you've got. There's uh, thresholds for them. And if you know that you have a field, if you find them in these bait stations, you know you got a field that you're going to be planting into Best case scenario is use a good seed treatment, and then you can also use some soil applied uh, insecticides. But be prepared. Best thing to know is what you have in that field before you go into that field. Be proactive. A lot of these insects like grass clumps. That's kind of where the adults lay their eggs, and so they develop around grass clumps that could be on the edge of fields or in fields. This is where we're getting a little bit tricky nowadays from an entomologic standpoint. A lot of growers are utilizing cover crops. Cover crops are great. They provide a lot of benefits of protecting that soil, help keep moisture, provide organic matter. But from our stance as an entomologist, we don't know what's going on yet. There's a lot of research going into these cover crops to find out how well these insects are surviving and what our best ways to control these insects are going into and planting into cover crops. Right now, what it's showing is if you get an earlier kill on your cover crop before planting, you might be able to do a little bit better job of getting some of these insects under control before you go to plant your crop in there. But I know a lot of guys are getting to the point where they like to plant into the cover crop green, 
So it's more of a watch out. If that's one of those things you're going to be doing, a, you know, really make sure you've got a good seed treatment on there and consider that insecticide uh, in furry. Well, hey, Julie, we want to we want to make sure we give a big thank you to Dr. Eric Blinka for, for joining us today and, and really uh, educating us and hopefully educating you all on pests and what's happening during this time, the cicadas. It's an interesting time. A lot of, lot of moving pieces right now, but hey, we want to we want to make sure we say we want to say thank you to him. And hey, just again, too, for all our viewers, there there is a lot of equipment moving around, around right now. Let's make sure everyone's staying safe and make sure you're keeping an eye on the road and slowing down when you need to. This has been Around the Farm brought to you by Climate Field View. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please like, subscribe, or share with a friend. Be sure to listen and get this podcast wherever you get podcasts as well. And then until next time, we'll see you around the farm.